So welcome everyone to our session on BPF, um, where we hope to go beyond the buzzword and explain how this core Linux technology can have a real impact on your daily Kubernetes experience. My name is Andy Randall. I'm the business guy at Kinfolk, uh, an open source company based in Berlin. Thanks. And my name is Alban Kriki. I'm a co-founder at Kinfolk and I'm the director of our labs team, which is actually very active in various Kubernetes and BPF related projects. Yeah, and I know it's always a struggle working out who's speaking in a joint talk. So to help you out, just remember that I'm the one with the British accent, that's Andy. And I am Alban, the one with the French accent. So um, first of all, hands up those in the audience if you've heard of BPF or eBPF. Okay, hands up. Okay, I see a few of you out there, a few at the back, maybe not so sure. So for those of you who aren't so clear, the concept of eBPF or extended Berkeley packet filter is you know, pretty simple at a high level. First of all, it allows the user to write programs that run in kernel space. Now, as Brendan Gregg of Netflix put it, this is a fundamental change to a 50 year old kernel model because up till now you've been used to writing programs that run in user space. Now you can actually run them in the context of the kernel. Now, these programs are not completely unrestricted. Um, there are certain hook points where they can attach into the kernel and data structures and helper functions that are available to them. And lastly, they run in a restricted virtual machine environment, which acts as a sandbox. And um, all of the code is verified against certain uh, strict conditions to ensure that, for example, the code will complete and not hang the kernel in an infinite loop. So why do you care about this? Um, because as a, as a Kubernetes application developer, you're probably not going to be writing BPF code, but you are going to be using uh, capabilities that BPF surfaces to you. So the first of those is um, potentially some of the fast networking uh, and customizable networking capabilities that you get um, available with BPF. Next, um, anyone who writes applications needs to debug applications. And BPF provides some pretty cool tools for uh, surfacing um, uh, things that are going on in the kernel that help you debug uh, either feature uh, problems or performance um, problems. And lastly, from an operations perspective, uh, BPF gives you some capabilities that really help when it comes to monitoring applications and also particularly monitoring them from a security perspective uh, to check that you haven't got attacks in your cluster. So these are all pretty good reasons to care about BPF, I think. Um, so at, at this point, I'm going to hand, hand over to Alban to uh, talk to you a little bit about the history of eBPF and how we got to where we are today. Alban. Thank you. So it started in uh, 1997, where we had uh, the first version of BPF. It was used for TCP dump, so for network capturing. And that was pretty much it um, until much later in 2014, uh, where we have the new eBPF for extended eBPF. So Alexi uh, Starovoltov come up, comes up with the idea of a universal in-kernel virtual machine, where we are kind of different eBPF program running together uh, for a variety of applications. Um, a bit later, in 2015, uh, we have the IOVisor uh, project established that comes uh, initially from a um, Plum Grid um, technology from Plum Grid, and then it get moved into the, under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Uh, a bit later, in 2016, we have XDP for Express Data Path, and that's the idea to apply the BPF program very early in the network stack, uh, so that uh, right in the NIC, ideally, we can filter packets and uh, block uh, unwanted uh, traffic, so it make it uh, very fast. In 2017, uh, we have uh, in the Linux kernel uh, 4.11, we have new um, data structure uh, like LPM maps uh, that make it possible to uh, filter a large amount of IP uh, or CIDR um, on the network traffic. In 2017, we have uh, a feature called SOC map. That's a new BPF map uh, that's used for um, intra-host network to make it uh, very fast by bypassing the network stack 
that's used in uh, Cilium on um, Istio when we use uh, Istio, the service mesh, together with Cilium, for example. In 2018, um, Facebook announced uh, the project Catron, that's a BPF uh, load balancer, and uh, Facebook announced to the world that they are using that on their uh, networks. Um, 2018, uh, we have a new uh, BPF helper function for uh, filtering uh, events by C groups that's used uh, for containers. And for example, I use that in uh, Trace Loop on Inspector Gadget to figure out which trace came from which pod on which container. And lastly, um, in my selection, um, in kernel 4.8, sorry, 5.8, we have a new kind of BPF ring buffer as a communication mechanism between the BPF program in kernel to user space. Um, that's a new ring buffer that is more, much more uh, efficient memory-wise. So I picked a few of those items to show how it's relevant to Kubernetes, for example, with a Cilium or Istio or uh, tracing tools on Kubernetes. So let's um, take these capabilities that Adolf talked about and um, look at the landscape of tools that are out there that you can uh, use. So the, the first layer that I want to talk about is there's a set of low level tools, um, which a lot of them have been around for quite a while, uh, where you get very low level access to BPF capabilities, typically on an individual host at a process level. Um, something like BPF tool, which actually ships with the Linux kernel or the um, BPF compiler collection, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, if you're coming at BPF from a, a programmer perspective and you want to be able to write programs to inject into the kernel, um, then there are libraries available that you can use that shortcut a lot of these um, capabilities to make it a lot simpler. Whether you're writing in uh, Go or C++ or Rust or Python, there's probably a, a good library for you out there. Um, when you, we get the next layer up, we start to, to look at more complete solutions and less kind of individual a APIs and um, libraries. And in the security and networking space is one of the main areas for um, the BPF is used. Um, Cilium was one of the first uh, BPF enabled networking solutions in uh, Kubernetes, but Calico has added it as well recently. Um, Catran, um, as I mentioned, um, Falco has used um, in uh, for security applications from uh, Sysdig. So uh, a lot of things that you can uh, plug into Kubernetes there. Then the last layer in visibility, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, you know, something that anyone in, from an operations perspective should be looking at these tools to say, you know, how can this give me greater insight to what's running in my cluster? So um, things like uh, Weave Scope um, or, or Hubble actually provide the capability to see in real time, what uh, what network connectivity is happening, um, how how things are uh, connecting in the cluster. There's a few other tools as well, which don't fit neatly into any of these categories. Um, things like um, the Cloudflare eBPF exporter uh, project or NetCost, uh, which actually analyzes your network uh, traffic to uh, give you some idea of what it's going to be costing you to run that in the cloud. Um, as an example of one of these tools, um, Hubble is from uh, uh, Cilium folks, uh, sits on top of the Cilium CNI plugin and surfaces up uh, metrics and, um, and also analyzes the kind of a graph view of your traffic in the Hubble UI and looks something like this, uh, you know, nicely displayed. You can see what the network traffic is. Um, and uh, there are other tools that do the similar thing. So we've scoped actually quite a, uh, a while back. Uh, the, um, our team at Kinfolk worked together with Weaveworks to author the agent that um, collects the data using BPF about um, network connections. Uh, you know, in this graph here, you can see which pod's talking to which pod, um, all thanks to BPF. One of the nice things about this is, as a part of this project, we developed a library called TCP Tracer BPF. And, um, you know, that's available. So if you wanted to build something similar, a lot of the base capabilities are there for you to build on. Um, the BPF compiler collection we've mentioned a couple of times because it really is the granddaddy of all these BPF tools. Um, and the nice thing about BCC is it's very um, kind of Linux style. So these are command line tools with arguments that uh, do one thing, do one thing well, allow you to snoop and control your system. Um, you know, really uh, 
quite easy to get up and running and using any of these um, tools. And I recommend you check those out if you haven't um, already. Um, BPF Trace is kind of the cousin to BCC, um, maybe less well uh, known and less frequently used um, because it does have a bit of a learning curve, but it's great for quickly writing custom BPF functions. It's got a lot of flexibility for tracing and debugging your Linux apps. As you can see with BCC and BPF Trace, there are a lot of tools, uh, really powerful one that come off the shelf, but uh, they don't know anything about containers or Kubernetes. So if you run Kubernetes uh, and you want to run that on your Kubernetes cluster, there is no easy way to use them. But Alban, if only there was a really easy way that these people who are running Kubernetes clusters could take some of these tools and apply them in Kubernetes. Yes. If only. That's where um, Kingfox Inspector Gadget come in, comes in. So you can think of Inspector Gadget as a Swiss army knife of BPF tools or gadgets for Kubernetes. Some of them come directly from BCC with a tiny uh, wrapper on top of them to make them Kubernetes aware, and some other are developed by Kingfox independently uh, outside of BCC. So what do we need to make a BPF tool Kubernetes aware? Uh, we need a few things. First, the granularity that we care about. Uh, we don't want to trace at the PID level or process level. Um, we don't necessarily want to trace all the process on the system. Uh, we only want to trace a process from a specific box usually. Um, that's not something so easy to do because a BPF programs running in the kernel, they don't know anything about Kubernetes pods or Kubernetes levels. So we need to do a bit of work there. Um, another thing we want to do is to uh, aggregate the information by labels. So we don't want to see the feeds or to select individual process, but uh, aggregate using uh, Kubernetes labels. And the last thing I want is to have a kubectl-like experience. So developers should not need to uh, SSH on a specific node. They should not need to know in advance, this is the node where my pod is, is running. Uh, they should have a kubectl um, experience where they have a, a command line inter interface directly for that. Um, so ideally, that's a kubectl plugin, which is exactly what we do. It looks a bit like that. So at the bottom uh, left, uh, I'm on my laptop. I use a kubectl gadget. That's a kubectl plugin. So it executes the kubectl gadget plugin. And then it only talks through the Kubernetes API. Um, it doesn't SSH when you know it, it uses Kubernetes native concepts like pods on the um, set and so on. Uh, from there, uh, Inspector Gadget deploys a pod on each node, that's a daemon set, and each of them will be able to execute the different gadgets. And it will uh, execute, for example, Trace Loop or those from BCC. And those will install a BPF program in the kernel, and the kernel will be able to uh, gather the information and send it back and send it back up to the um, CLI to kubectl gadget. So what do we have today as gadget in Inspector Gadget? Um, the first one here is capabilities. It's a way to get um, uh, information about capabilities that are exercised in your pod. Um, the use case is, for example, you have a pod that needs some privilege, maybe it needs kernel admin, sysadmin, but uh, it's quite difficult to know if you are not deep into this uh, level of uh, kernel knowledge. Um, so what often people do is just to give all the capabilities, but that's not so great uh, security-wise uh, instead of just giving what you need. Uh, this tool is, uh, allows you to uh, run the pod and see what actual capability are exercised by the pod. And then you can pick that information to write your pod spec on uh, PSPs. Other gadgets in Inspector Gadget are open snoop, exec snoop, bind snoop. They tell you, they tell you when a file is open, when a new binary is executed, or when uh, there is a new TCP port open on uh, by your pods. Uh, so you can see this information in real time as it happens. Uh, other tools are TCP top and TCP tracer. So that gives you uh, the network traffic happening inside the pod. And what is the most um, voluminous traffic? with TCP, TCP top. Another is TCP tracer where you can see one new line for each new TCP connections to see what's happening in your pods. Uh, profile is a CPU profiler that this one comes directly from BCC as well. Um, it's 
useful to see why something is slow. Sometimes it's not so easy to see which part or which thing is slow. One example I had to debug is when uh, there was a Kubernetes system with way too many um, repeatable role for some reason. There was a bug in the old version of Kubernetes. And then uh, this generate uh, the network traffic to be slow, but that was not so easy to uh, debug. With this tool, we could see uh, what are the network, oh, sorry, the kernel stacks and user space uh, stack that are the most, the most often called. And then I can see uh, what's happening there. Uh, Trust loop is, uh, I call it a fly, um, fly recorder. It's a record of the system call done by all the ports and keep them in a memory in a ring buffer. And just in case something crashed, then the user can ask uh, what happened and see the last few season calls uh, exercised. And the last one I'll talk about now is a network policy advisor. It's the use case is when you come to develop, uh, to implement security on, on your uh, ports, uh, but you come to a project without any previous knowledge of that, it's quite difficult to know what is supposed to talk to which other pod. Uh, so if you use the network policy advisor, you can run your pod, uh, see what kind of network activity is there, and it will automatically uh, create network policies that you can look, uh, see if they make sense, and if they make sense, pick them up. It's a lot faster than creating them from scratch um, when you don't have initial knowledge of the project. So uh, let's take a look of a couple of those tool in actions. Let's see. The first tool I want to show you today is um, XXNoop. So that's a inspector gadget tool that uh, allows me to see what kind of program are executed inside each pod. So let's get started. kubectl gadget has to run inspector gadget. Uh, choose the tool xxnoop. And then I don't want to filter, I don't want to get information about all the ports, but only um, a specific one. I will select the namespace default. And then I will use a Kubernetes label selector to choose only uh, the ports with the label run equal cooking. So let me run that. Um, I have only one node in my cluster uh, on Minikube. And now I start to record the, the new program being executed. Uh, there is nothing to display yet because I don't have any um, pod to record with that label. Uh, so now I will create a new pod. So kubectl run. Get some options. And I will select the image uh, Fedora. And I give it the name cooking so that it uh, will have the label cooking. Uh, so it will be selected by my inspector gadget tool. And in there, I will execute a script, a shell script with uh, SH. And I will use this anti-pattern, which is to curl a shell script and execute it uh, for the purpose of this demo. So here I curl the shell script. On this website. And I pipe the shell script into bash directly. Uh, so here I don't know what this script contain. So uh, hopefully Inspector Gadget will tell me uh, what it is doing. First, it takes some time to download the uh, Fedora uh, container image. And when it's ready, it should, uh, mm -hmm. here it is, uh, start to see the commands. And here I see uh, it will execute grep, cat, org, NKDIR, uh, RPM, and so on. So I see it downloaded RPM file here. Uh, and then it's uh, installed it with RPM and so on. Um, so in this way, I can use Inspector Gadget to uh, select a specific pod with, um, with labels and then see what is doing uh, with XXNoop in this case. But I can also use OpenStoop to uh, select to see what are the new files being opened. 
for buying Snoop to see if it um, listen on a TCP port, like port 80, for example. Uh, um, I cannot, I can see that in real time um, in, in my terminal. Okay, so hopefully it will finish soon, and then I will uh, show you the next demo. Let me stop that first. Okay, the next demo will be about um, the network policy advisor. Uh, first, I will show you that I don't have any pod running in the demo namespace. And then I will uh, deploy something there, but first uh, I will use the network policy uh, gadget to um, record all the network connection that will happen and uh, try to generate a network policy from that. So let's start with kubectl gadget network policy. And the first step is to use this subcommand monitor to record the network traffic. And I will only select um, a list of namespace. So in this case, only one. And I will output the result in this file, network trace.log. Okay, so what it's doing is uh, installing the BPF uh, filter. And every time there is a new connection, a new uh, network traffic in that namespace, it will record something in that file. Uh, for now, there is no traffic because I don't have any pod. Uh, so let me uh, deploy something. So kubectl apply in this demo namespace. And then I will uh, select this Kubernetes manifest uh, file. As you can see, it contains a lot of services and a lot of uh, deployment, but it doesn't contain any network policy so far. So all the pods are free to talk to each other. Uh, the only thing I need to do now is to uh, see uh, what uh, traffic is uh, gathered and uh, what network policy are generated. Let's see if my pods are created. kubectl get pod uh, dash n demo. Okay, most of them are already um, started. Let's see, one of the difficulty to get started, but that's good enough. Now uh, let's see what has been generated. I will stop the recording uh, file, the recording gadget into this file. And uh, just to show you how it looks like, it just um, piece of JSON that lists the different TCP connection that happen there. Uh, but uh, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to read that file actually. Uh, what you can do is to use inspector gadget uh, with the network policy um, gadget uh, with this report that will generate the network policies. So I take this network trace file that I just generated, and then I will create network policy. .yaml. Okay, so now I can look into this uh, network policy YAML and that it contains just the list of network policy that has been generated by Inspector Gadget. So I can see, for example, that uh, the um, card service uh, is able to talk to uh, Redis on this TCP port and so on. So it created a network policies for all the different traffic that has happened. And what you can do now is to see if that makes sense. And if it does, you can use that as a base to write your uh, network policy. That's a lot faster than writing them from scratch. Thank you. So that's it. Thanks, Alban. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, I, to all of you out there in Kubeland, I hope you got excited by that and uh, inspired to go out and try it on your own clusters. Thanks for coming to our talk today and we look forward to your questions now.